Welcome everyone! This is the first video of the ninth chapter of the Restarkly Electronics 2 curriculum. In this episode we will learn about the tools for human-machine interfaces. First, we will review the fundamental input and output devices that are key to the operation of modern electronic systems. Among other things, we will discuss displays including LED, LCD and OLED displays and the practical use of the latter. In the last video, we will demonstrate what we have learned by creating a software project. We will implement our project using an example program, which you can access on the crystalclearelectronics2.eu website. Let me introduce our presenter, Viktor Vince, an electrical engineer, who is currently leading an implant development project at Neonas Limited. Hi and welcome everyone! I will be assisted in this chapter by András Klenzner, who will be a first-year student at the University of Obuda, majoring in cybersecurity engineering this year. I know that he has been interested in the world of IT before, and that he loves programming as a hobby. That's right, I'm also a big football fan. I've been to my favorite team's arena three times. I've brought a rubber ducky with the logo of this team, namely Bayern Munich. Andrish, could you please tell us a few words about why this topic is important to anyone considering electronics development? Of course. Machines can only make our lives easier if they do exactly what we want them to do. But to achieve this, we need to be able to control them effectively and intervene in their operation when necessary. Human Machine Interfaces, or HMI for short, are a means of facilitating this exchange of information. Victor, what sort of solutions are needed to create a real interaction between a device and the user? This is an excellent question. Since this is a two-way communication, the device must be equipped with hardware peripherals that allow this. From the machine's point of view, we need inputs and outputs. The inputs enable us to input data, which gives us the key to control. The outputs provide us with feedback so we can get an insight into the operation of the electronics. Of course, hardware alone is not enough for proper operation. The software that brings the system to life is essential. This is going to be very exciting, so let's get started. Chapter 9 was written by David Kulcher and proofread by Sapolj Hadaric. One of the most commonly used input interfaces is the push button, some of which we have placed on our breadboard. We use three push buttons to visualize how to manage a menu system. I will talk about the functions currently associated with the push buttons later. Input devices are also the well-known switches, joysticks and the like. These peripherals have either already been introduced to you or will be covered in a later chapter of the curriculum so I won't go into them in detail. If you are interested in switches, such as push buttons, two position switches, rotary switches and so on in more depth, I recommend you read the seventh chapter of the Crystal Clear Electronics 1 curriculum, which is called Switching Devices and contains a lot of useful information on the subject. The most basic output element that can be used to provide information is the LED, which stands for Light Emitting Diode. It can have different information content depending on its use. The simplest indication may be whether it is lit. For example, an LED on the development board tells us if the microcontroller power is available. Feedback can be given by flashing at different frequencies or even by using the brightness. Another popular solution is a multicolor light source called RGB LED, which stands for red, green, blue LED. It is excellent for status information, for example, as the different states can be well represented by the different colors. An RGB LED can produce the colors red, green, blue and other color combinations that can be mixed. If you want to communicate more information to the user, you can use several LEDs and clearly assign to each one what it indicates. Just think of a router, how many LEDs it has and each one has a meaning. In order to display more complex data, we can arrange the LEDs in some kind of structure on a breadboard to achieve a more visual display. For example, 
We can come up with solutions where the percentage of the PWM fill factor setting is visualized by several LEDs arranged in a row next to each other. You have already seen examples of the use of LEDs. Just think of the running strip lights project or the project on push buttons and LEDs. The amount of information that can be transmitted via LEDs is quite limited. Does this solution have a place in a modern application? Definitely. There are several situations where simple yes, no information is required. And in debugging, when more complex output devices are not working, LEDs can still be of help. If we take the idea of using structured LEDs to convey more complex information further, we quickly arrive at the world of LED displays. These devices now allow us to display numbers and letters. Before we go into more detail about LED displays, let's look at the simpler types of displays and how they are grouped. LED displays, including 7-segment displays, alphanumeric displays and dot matrix displays. The next major category is the LCD displays, including 7-segment LCD displays, alphanumeric LCD displays and graphical LCD displays. The last major category is OLED displays, which also include alphanumeric and graphical solutions. I suppose each has its own area of application. Exactly. For example, I could put a high-resolution graphical LCD display in a watch instead of a 7-segment display, but it would not be a suitable solution for the task in terms of price or power consumption. So let's look at what to choose for, what task and why. The 7-segment display, shown in the picture, is a popular component due to its simplicity. This display has the function of displaying the Arabic numerals. If you look at the structure, each segment has an LED. The designation of the segments is constant in the world of 7-segment displays, which are the following, as shown in the diagram. By switching the appropriate segments on and off, we can display the Arabic numerals, the summary table of which you can also see in detail in the written curriculum. The switching of the LEDs in the segments varies from type to type, so you should always check the arrangement in which they are connected. There are types of displays where the anode legs are common and there are types where the cathode legs are at the same potential. This is also important for us from a software point of view, as the LEDs are controlled with this in mind. The LEDs can be switched one by one, as usual. The disadvantage of this solution is that you need a lot of GPIO pins to operate it, but the advantage is that you don't need extra hardware. You've probably heard the joke that software is free, but not everything should be done with software. For example, if you don't have enough GPIO legs in your microcontroller, you need to add a driver circuit called a BCD to 7 segment driver decoder. This binary coded decimal generates signals from the binary coded decimal format to drive the 7 segment display. To produce a binary coded decimal number, the local values of the decimal number system are used whereby 4 bits are assigned to a local value since the largest occurring number in the decimal number system is 9, and therefore 4 bits are required. We use it because it is much quicker and much more efficient to convert from the 10 number system than to do the same in binary. For example, 19 will be represented by 00011001. The easiest way to explain this is through an example for which I have chosen a 7-segment integrated circuit called SN74LS47. The table in the datasheet illustrates how it works. The decimal value to be displayed must be written in binary form, 4 bits, and the voltage level corresponding to the logic value of the bits must be connected to the inputs of the IC. The output will now show the control signals of the decoded 7-segment display. As an example, Take decimal 5, which is written in binary 0101. This means that the control circuit's D input should be set to low, C to high, B to low, and A to high. In this case, segments A, C, D, F, and G will be switched on. This type of display has a wide range of options, available in all colors and sizes with variable footprints, LEDs with variable characteristics, and so on. The next type 
is the alphanumeric display that is the upgraded seven segment display. As you can see in the picture, the alphanumeric display is based on a seven segment display. The difference is that usually the horizontal segments have been divided into two parts and an additional three three segments have been added to the upper and lower range. With these changes and additions, we are now able to display the letters of the English alphabet. Its control is basically similar to the one presented before, so we will not go into details now. The most complex solution in this family is the dot matrix display. In this type of display, the LEDs are arranged as a dot grid and connected in columns and rows. Their control can therefore be implemented using column and row selection logic. Here too, there is a wide range of types which vary in size, LED number and LED density. The advantage is that the information to be displayed is not limited to the world of numbers and letters, but can be used to show more complex shapes and images. One of the main advantages of this type of display is its high brightness and robustness. You may see such displays in various street thermometers, digital signs displaying information on motorways. The next big display family is the commonly known LCD, which is the abbreviation for liquid crystal display. I'd like to explain their construction and operation using the following figure. A pixel is composed of a liquid crystalline material sandwiched between two transparent sheets, two electrodes, a front and a black polarization layer, and a light source. To illustrate the operation briefly and simply, in the default case, when no voltage is applied to the electrodes, the liquid crystal assumes a twisted state which helps the light reach the visible part of the pixel. This is the case shown in the left hand figure. The pixel will then be seen as bright. In the case where a voltage is applied to the electrodes, the structure of the liquid crystal changes, resulting in light not being able to reach the output. This is the case shown in the right hand figure. The meaning of the letters in the figure is as follows. I is the displayed image, P are the polarization layers, G are the glass layers, E electrodes, LC the liquid crystal, L light, S switch, and V voltage source. The principle of operation will not be explained in full detail in this chapter because it would require additional knowledge such as how light acts as a wave or as another example, how polarization works and its effects. This is a widely used display device as it is cheap, easy to produce and can be used in direct sunlight thanks to the backlighting. It also has the disadvantage of less accurate color reproduction due to backlight. The simplest type of LCD display is the 7 segment LCD. The only thing to note about this type is that the characters that can be displayed are the same as on a traditional 7 segment display. In addition to the technological differences, the controls have also been changed, which I will explain in the next display type, the alphanumeric LCD display. This is the most popular type of LCD because it allows you to achieve fast results with little energy investment. It's alphanumeric, so you can display only fixed character images, but these can be letters, numbers, or punctuation marks. This makes it more universal than the 7 segment type and in most cases it's sufficient to achieve the desired functionality. These models are usually equipped with the HD44780 controller or some compatible controller as the Hitachi HD44780 LCD controller has become an industry standard over time. Since the standard was established all manufacturers have sought compatibility in terms of the footprint, size, and instruction set of LCD modules. This has led to their similarity, ease of use, and interchangeability. You can always find out how to control the display by looking at the datasheet. Fortunately, due to its widespread use, there are many pre-written software libraries for it, which makes the development of the projects faster. Graphical LCD displays are different from the previous types in that the pixels of the display can be freely controlled even displaying images. This means much more freedom for the user, but it takes much longer to achieve the desired function. The last large display group 
is the OLED display. OLED is short for Organic Light Emitting Diode. These three words succinctly summarize the principle behind this technology. There are organic materials that emit light when energized, and this is what is used in OLED panels. Many of the benefits are due to the fact that no backlighting is required. The layered structure familiar from displays is simplified, resulting in lighter and thinner displays. They are also energy saving. They achieve perfect black color, so the contrast is also of high quality. They have accurate, stable colors with no distortion. And they also have an excellent viewing angle. Interestingly, the principle of OLED displays is derived from fireflies. There is also an alphanumeric version of OLED displays, but as the principle of operation has already been discussed, it will not be discussed again here. Well, that's enough history and background knowledge for now. Instead, let's learn about graphic displays and see how they work in practice. You're quite right, but you need this much information to help the viewer feel confident in navigating the numerous types of displays available on the market. In the following, we will look at the use of OLED graphic displays in practice using our development board. In it, you will find a display of our choice, which we will bring to life. Let's get started. How do we connect the panel to the development board? For this exercise, we need some information from the datasheet of the display about the numbering, naming and function of the legs. This shows that we are dealing with a peripheral with I2C communication capable of operating from 3.3 volts. The next question is the power consumption of the device, that is, whether we need an external power supply to use it or whether the 5 volt USB input is sufficient to drive the 3.3 volt power circuit. This information can also be found in another table of the datasheet. Since the current consumption of the peripheral is quite low, even if half the pixels are lit, it is only 22 milliampers, it's not necessary to use an external power supply, that is, 3.3 volts through the debugger is sufficient. The display is connected according to the schematic diagram. Connect the 3.3 volt supply voltage to the VCC leg and the common ground to GND. For communication, we will use the I2C2 peripheral of the microcontroller. So we connect the SCL leg to the PF1 leg of the microcontroller and the SDA leg to the PFO leg of the microcontroller. In addition, the I2C data lines are connected to the supply voltage via a single pull-up resistor. The push buttons and the LEDs are connected in the usual way. That's it for the hardware tasks, now let's get on with collecting the data we need for software development. Since we are talking about a graphical display, we need to know its size, which is clarified right at the beginning of the datasheet. The resolution line data means that we can work with 128 times 64 pixels, which should be arranged as follows. This is our canvas. It can be painted on. In our case, it is by default a black background on which we can draw light dots. Here, the light dots are blue. If we do this painting cleverly enough, we can turn the dots into letters, numbers, shapes and pictures. Of course, it's possible to invert the colors when you draw in black on a light background. And of course, we will see how to do that. Before we put the datasheet aside, one thing we need to find out is the address on the I2C bus where the display expects the instructions. This information can be found in the 815 MCU I2C interface section of the OLED display datasheet PDF document as a supplement to the curriculum. The slave address consists of the 011110 bits and the value of SA0. In the case of the latter, it will be zero since this leg of the module is connected to ground with a zero ohm resistor, so the address is binary 0111100, which is 3C in hexadecimal. This address can be found in one of the source files. I think we have enough information for now. Stay tuned for the next video, where we'll explore the software use of the display. Until then, goodbye. See you.